All right. Well, welcome everyone to today's Mars guest lecture. Uh, the presentation is on lessons in design control and teenagers uh, revamping the NASA history website. Our presenter today is a, uh, an iSchool graduate, uh, Robin K. Rogers from the MLIS program. And I want to tell you a little bit about Robin. Some of you I, I know are uh, first semester students thinking about what you might do with your lives uh, after graduation. And uh, so uh, this I think will give you some ideas of how one student was uh, able to make a, a number of changes, but still enjoy very much what she's doing. Uh, Robin serves right now as the inaugural senior, senior archivist leading archival activities within the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, in the history office. And in this role, she's responsible for developing archival standards, practices and operations for the VA history program and the National VA History Center to be established on the VA Medical Center campus in in Dayton, Ohio, where she's now located. Ms. Rogers comes to VA from the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, having served as chief archivist. Previous posts include National Archives and Records Administration, uh, known as NARA, holding a variety of positions in research services in Anchorage, Alaska, San Bruno, California, and College Park, Maryland offices, as well as in agency services focusing on Department of Defense appraisal, including capstone and other electronic records. She has extensive experience in senior leadership, policy development, programmatic creation and strategic rehabilitation, as well as the intersection of records management and archives. She graduated with honors from Virginia State University, holding a bachelor's degree in American history, as well as the master's degree in information and library sciences with a concentration in archival management from SJSU. And now I'll turn the um, mic over to Robin. Well, thank you so much. I, I have to tell you, you sound, make me sound way more interesting than I really am. I was very impressed. <laughs> I couldn't get out all of those words. So. <laughs> all right. So good afternoon. I am so very pleased to be here. Uh, thank you to Dr. Franks for inviting me and also to the entire team who works behind the scenes to make things happen. I'm, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. So one of the things that I have learned through my years is clearly not how to operate Zoom and change slides. There we go. One of the things I've learned through my years of giving these sorts of presentations is that it's really important to tell people when you're going to stop talking, especially when you might be the thing standing between them and their lunch. So given that it's noon on the West Coast, that might be how the day shaping up for some people. So that's what we're going to do today. Uh, Dr. Franks has already covered my bio, so we're going to cruise through that. I'm going to talk a little bit about Apollo 11 itself. So that way you know why it's such a driver of this project. Uh, tell you some of the things I learned in the process and then leave room for questions. So since Dr. Franks was kind enough to do my bio, this is my, my about me slide. One of the questions I get pretty frequently is, is what in the world possessed you to leave NASA? Um, I love NASA. I miss my amazing crew and my very comfortable chair. But Mike Visconage, the VA's first chief historian, called and said, hey, do you want to come build a national level federal program from scratch? And I said, yes. In our industry, you know, people go their whole careers without ever even seeing that kind of opportunity come up, much less receiving an offer. So here we are. Um, if you, these are my girls up here on the right. And um, I did see a couple familiar names in the in the chat list. And so they can probably confirm if you've known me for more than five minutes, you'll know that if I can find a way to work a dog and a horse into a conversation, I'm, I'm probably going to do that. So there, there may be references coming. Who knows? We'll see where the conversation goes. So not everybody is a total space nerd. Um, and the NASA suite of activities is huge. There are, these are basically the things that you need to know to be able to talk about it at a party. The top is self-explanatory, so let's talk about the LM and CM and then frame that to what you already know. LM is lunar module, and that's what took Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin down to the moon's surface, where Armstrong said his famous line, one small step, you guys all know that line, right? And then the, the CM, the command module, was piloted by Michael Collins, who basically cruised circles around the circumference of the moon, confirmed that there was indeed the dark side of the moon, because he saw it, and was out of communications for about 45 minutes at a time. And that's what led the media to the whole loneliest man portrayal, which um, he hates, by the way, just so you know. 
He wasn't mad about not landing because he had the other half of the mission, which was to get them home. Uh, the Apollo 11 mission was not just to land on the, a man on the moon, but also to bring them back. So down here in, in this line right here, there's a lot of iconic photography taken throughout the Apollo missions. And it's really easy to mix up uh, what was shot when and why. And so this first link kind of just goes through the missions and shows you some of the really beautiful photography that were associated with each of them. And last but not least is the Apollo in real time. And just so folks understand what an, a feat of IT this thing is, uh, video of the mission control was silent. Audio was done on separate tapes. And so you have to remember this was 1969. Tape was very, very expensive and they weren't making a movie. So Ben Feist uh, took his team and took the video and matched it up with the audio and then matched it up with the transcripts and then put it in real time. So you, you can imagine as somebody's mouth is moving in the video, sitting and listening to hours of audio and then matching those two things in uh, something like Camtasia or another audio software, and then taking the transcripts and matching those up rolling as people are talking and the, the tape is moving and so is the transcript, and then putting it in real time on a website. So that means that you're walking through the mission as it happened, not just the highlights or the clips that people want you to see that are really cool. It is the entire Apollo 11 mission. Um, one of my, is it this one or 17? I can't remember if it's Apollo 11 or Apollo 17, but my favorite part is when one of the engineers gets turned down for a date because she was washing and setting her hair that night. And you can hear the whole awkward conversation as well as read the transcripts of it, meaning that somebody else was listening to that conversation and typing along. So it's, it's just really a great experience. Um, and it's all archival footage, archival soundtrack, and textual records that have come together to create this incredible experience of IT. Anyway, I can talk about it for a lot. Um, moving on, it's worth the time and is amazing. So as information professionals, we know that anniversaries, usually zeros and fives, tend to be societal drivers. Uh, I mean, nobody really celebrates like the 12th anniversary or something, right? It's, it's the 10th or the 15th. And in this case, it was the 50th. So our public affairs teams were doing excellent work in the promotion of that and especially because of the tracking stations across the world, many countries had a role in the Apollo 11. So it wasn't just a US-based event. It, it was quite literally a, a worldwide event and our analytics were showing it. And I'm gonna pause on this point and come back around to that to the end. So first I also need to note that I'm not criticizing the older history.nasa.gov website. It was one of the first .gov sites out there and for the time, it was cutting edge. Um, it did exactly what President Clinton wanted to do at the time. It was a useful tool for staff and NASA information, made NASA information available in ways that had never been done before. The only actual problem with that site is that the way we use the web changes and flash went away. I know the original programmer and I know the content manager, so I, I promise this is no criticism of their work. I also need to make it really clear that I am not speaking officially for NASA today. Uh, I'm just here to tell a story. Dr. Franks liked it when she and I were talking about it when we were working on something else. And we thought there would be just things others might find value in. Um, also, I tend to talk about this as my site, what finger quotes my, because I was the program owner, but this is as much Garrett Shea's work as it is mine. And without him, this would not be the glorious product that we have. Um, so all of those disclaimers done, now let's get to the story. So in the before, it was rather easy to get a website up. You bought a book, you learned to write some code, you had a box of Pop-Tarts and a half rapid Mountain Dew handy, and at about 4 a.m., you wound up with some sort of web presence. Um, okay, see, Pop-Tarts were important because they're nothing but processed sugar, they're shelf-stable forever, and most importantly, you only need one hand to open and eat them. Um, if you were, well, now I'm digressing. If you were really good, you, when you were done, you had a site with stable nested hyperlinks, some fixed imagery, and a counter on the bottom that tracked page visits, most of which were yours, and no crumbs on your keyboard. Um, so there's a specific tearing technique for the package with the one, anyway, I'm digressing again. So the point is, is that there's a lot of planning that had to go into it because webs, websites were static information pushers. Dynamic content and analytics had not been born yet, and there was certainly no such thing as a user population study. Many of us in middle to senior leadership were around to see the very beginnings of the internet and, and that's exactly what NASA had. So I'm just gonna double check that chat real quick and 
make sure there are no questions. And chat does not want to be chat. Come on, little chat, you can do it. Apparently it can't. Okay, um, so apparently on, on the way that these screens are set up, I can't actually see the chat while I even share. Can somebody pot, say, you know, just bring up if, if, if there is? Uh, no questions yet, okay. Robin. Thank you. There we go. Let's see if that work. So this may be a trip down memory lane for a few of us. Um, normally, I, I would ask if I could get a show of hands if there's anybody that was around for this era because it's going to tell me if my jokes are going to be funny, but I can't see the screen, so we'll, we'll just bypass the show of hands and we'll just pretend my jokes are still funny. So in about 05, the groundbreaker we know as Flash came along and we started embedding media into our pages, which we shouldn't have been trusted with. And last year, Adobe decided that we couldn't have nice things, and so they end of life it as of this year. For the federal government, that means that all of our pages that have Flash product, and let me tell you, we put it everywhere, it no longer meets security requirements. So now we all have dead pages that look like this. So if you've been cruising around various government pages and you see stuff like this with just these big blank boxes, that's what happened. They made us get rid of all of our Flash. So now you're seeing why these things are becoming problems, right? Anniversaries bearing down on us, and because the landing is such a cultural icon, people are talking. People wanna share their stories with us. They wanna share their stories with each other. We would get calls at 3 a.m. because international audiences couldn't find a tidbit of information on the website. And let me tell you, Twitter had opinions with capital letters, had opinions about that. So our stats started to show some trends that senior leadership just didn't like, and, and it's understandable, right? But there was just this momentum and this energy that I thought could sustain the change. So I brought it to Bill, my boss, who filled me in on the backstory of previous attempts and some of the players who would need to be involved. Um, there's multiple parts that happen uh, when you're bringing an agency from a, a federal level, when you're bringing in a new website or a significant revamp. It's not just you and the development team. So we, we talked about that. Um, and then he turned me loose to go make a, a project scope. And I have to tell you that Bill Berry and his wife, Monica, are among my favorite people on this planet. And so I didn't exactly make him a project scope. I sort of made him a half-filled website. Um, I do have some development experience and I, I can find my way around Dreamweaver. So I, I brought him an actual product and that's actually what made all the difference. That's when he greenlit it and we called a meeting with development and some other parties that needed to be at the table. So despite some of the challenges and obstacles like not having a functional DMS, um, a CMS that was inappropriate for what we were trying to do, no extra staff, no budget, um, and about a four month deadline, I figured what could go wrong, right? Yeah, sure, we're going with that. So first and foremost, on a project like this, you have to do your pre-work. You have to know what you are asking for. And the more that you know what your required end state is, the easier it is for your development team to help you get there. And if you don't know, that's, that's okay. But you have to be honest with them about what you do and don't know. And moreover, release some of the control back to them. And that can be really hard, but if you don't know what you want, you have to share that. So bring some examples of things that you do like and things that you know that you don't like because it helps them find the commonalities. They are the experts at this and they will find the jumps between those two things that, that we don't necessarily think about natively like the way that they do. So when you're doing that, when, when you're trying to figure out what it is that, that you want and moving into these kinds of meetings with this, knowing what you have and what you want and what you need, but most importantly, where you want to be at the end are the things that you can do most to help them. Because I, I think we've probably all been on this, the receiving end of this kind of conversation. I don't know what I want, but I know that's not it. So go do something else. Okay, tell me more about what you're thinking. Well, I don't know, but it's not that, right? You can see how incredibly frustrating. There's, there's no navigational point there. So the better plan you have walking in the door and the more rapport you build with your team, the better the entire process is just gonna be for everybody. Um, building a website in today's environment is incredibly complicated. It's no longer a thing that can be built in a night, dumped on a server and pushed out despite what that nifty YouTube ad tells you. So there are reasons that the profession has developed and split the way that it has. 
It's, it's a complex process that blends art, both social and hard science and technology and budget. That's an incredibly important part of it. Um, there's time involved and time of all of those people. At least in the federal government, many of those departments also tend to be contractors. They're not necessarily civil servants, which means there's an entire aspect of business process uh, that is utterly invisible to us. So when, you're, when you know and you respect the fact that you are not the only party at the table, it helps also further for that to respect each industry in its own entity and not just this conglomerate of the, those web folks, right? In the parentheses, those web folks or in the, uh, the quotations. So I walked in with a site that was over halfway developed and now just needed finer tuning. Um, and because functionally it did what I needed it to do, Garrett could do what he did best, which is make something that actually worked in the way that the user and the owner, that was me, wanted it to, but it was also beautiful to boot. So we, we didn't have to have that push pull because he could see exactly what the vision of the in-state was supposed to be. Um, now, none of this to say is that it was easy and uncomplicated. It, it's actually probably one of the most complicated projects I've ever worked with an incredibly sharp precipice for a failure point. Even with that great work, working, yeah, it's a good spot. Even with that great working synergy that we had, you know, it still took three weeks longer than what we had planned. And when you have that hard date of anniversary, like, you know, that's not a movable point on the calendar, right? It's a hard date, hard release date. So Garrett and I had some really long hours because we were doing things like server tracking and refreshes. And those things happen best when traffic is lowest. Uh, NASA has an incredibly international audience. So we found out there were windows that it was best to be able to do this according to uh, international time zones. Um, and it was often at 11 o'clock. Um, and so remember in the before when I was talking about the Pop-Tarts and I got distracted on it. So it's been about 20 years since I've had a Pop-Tart at midnight, but it was like no time had passed. Man, like you tear the packet in this direction. None of those things have changed. Um, Y'all, I'm old, okay? Midnight is way past my bedtime and I have to be fed if we're gonna be keeping me up that late. So even though we're talking on the server, we ran into some significant issues, um, some of which we knew were gonna happen. We absolutely had planned and we planned for the time and we banked that in but some of them were just a surprise. We had no idea that was gonna happen at three o'clock in the morning. And we, we both got to work and we found these, right? And that derailed the whole day. And this is where that, that follow-on planning and making sure that that respect, right? Because immediately your stress level rises and your first instinct is to find somebody to blame, right? Well, when you come with, with a position of respect, it helps to, to mitigate that. So one of the other things that we also agreed upon immediately is that there was gonna be a history 2.0 push at the end of August because we had to make choices about time or content. It's okay to not be 100% complete as long as you have a defined and measurable plan to make up the gap and you actually implement it. It's not enough to come to the table with a plan, you have to have an implementation plan as well. Um, interestingly, part of that gap that came in my feedback and user population studies. So when you are deeply entrenched in a project, uh, especially one that you're spearheading, it all makes intrinsic sense to you, right? Like you know why this is here or how that decision came about or why this was not done. Um, and you, all, you know all about it, it makes sense, you know why. But looking from the outside in, some of those things were not apparent. And a website is, you know, it's the most outside in thing a government office can have. Um, it, it exists to do exactly that, right? To allow the public a window into what that office is doing with their taxpayer dollars. They want to be able to use that site. And so part of the early planning process needed to be dedicated to figure out how they were using it, as well as how you want people to use it. Because in, especially in this case, those were very different things. Um, there was in, there's internal and external ways to do that. Uh, a user experience, a UXT, a user experience test is usually, that's done with professionals. And beta test is usually an internal process, but feedback, now that's an entirely different process and that is wide open. I, we've, I found that the best way to make sure that things make sense to somebody who's not you, or in this case me, is to ask somebody who isn't you or me, right? So to ask somebody who's not the owner. Um, asking somebody who doesn't have a stake in the product or the process. Uh, once we went live, the most useful feedback actually came from my 20 year old and a group of friends' kids. You know, 
digital natives. Um, and, and looking across, you know, I, I, I see, you know, they were in the same age group that, that some of you are in, born with phones in their hands. Um, they find my iPod to be a charming relic of the past. Um, and there's expectations, but most importantly, they were very good at explaining why something did work or did not work without delving into how they thought I should fix it, which was an issue with other testers. Remember, I was working with no DMS, a CMS that wasn't appropriate for what we were doing, no budget, no staff, no time. So things were the way they were as part of response to that. So there, there was one high school senior who had just graduated the month before uh, and going through the, the middle college years. So the, the, the population was accustomed to doing research online. And the other thing I found is they provided just really great feedback as they were switching between Android and Chromebook and Apple and Mac and iPhone, sometimes on the same day working on the same project and, and really gave me some good feedback about how those things all fit together, what their experience with it was. And moreover, their lack of investment in the project gave them room to be honest and, and really open without you know, worrying about looking foolish or damaging relationships that might be needed down the road. Um, there was no angle, there was no agenda. They, they simply tested and, and gave feedback, which was exactly what was needed. So hire a teenager while they still know everything. So I see a little dot here and there might be something in chat. Um, losing the historical mode, yep, exactly, exactly, Tony. Okay, so remember I said there was no functional DMS and inappropriate CMS and terabytes of shareable content. So, so how do we navigate that? What were the priorities we needed to keep in mind? Now remember, this is a surface skim, right? For every point that I'm talking about in here, there was maybe hundreds of more refined points and that would be a much longer talk. So I, I showed you guys a, a talk, the top of the, the previous NASA history website. So we went from that to this. It was very uh, text heavy. It was, it was two colors, uh, which were not 508 compliant colors, by the way. Um, there, there was no imagery. There, there was nothing to look at. And so that was one of the things that was, that was very important with us for, to make something that was visually appealing as well as useful. But also, I wanted to make sure that my center history programs, whose sites were a little bit more challenging to find, had immediate presence. So especially for, for where San Jose is, Ames is, is very local to you. I wanted to make sure that people were actually able to find their most local center history program while still being able to go uh, big NASA. So, and that's what you see here. So next we took a look at our research statistics to figure out what people were actually asking about. Um, we had little in the way of resources, but much in the way of content. So we had to make decisions about reconciling those two things. And this is how we did it. We took the top 12 research questions that people had asked us about, so right here, two research questions. And hopefully my network is keeping up with this. Yep. Since, since we talked about lunar module and command module, yeah, let's go down here. Okay, so let's take a look at lunar module and command module since we spoke about them earlier. Now, remember I said that we have no active backside DMS that, so could, that could support this. So we looked at our user population studies. We had, we had about 14 different user population studies and figured out that the bulk of their needs could be served by basically creating this. Um, we had to really think about it. And so we took these overarching materials, right? Audio, video, books, documents, right? And the goal, our stated goal was not to try to encapsulate anything and everything that somebody might want to know about the lunar and command modules, right? We wanted to get with basically looking to give serious researchers, so number one, give serious researchers enough material to help shape and refine your questions before contacting us. Uh, those of you who have some work experience know the researcher, I want everything you have on the lunar module. It doesn't really work like that. <laughs> Um, but also to help people who are just interested in browsing just enough to feel satisfied and just maybe dig a little deeper. Uh, I was really trying to get to that, huh, I didn't know that, from that particular population. Um, moreover, we chose material that wasn't already floating about the internet on 12 different other sites. We're trying to stimulate new research, right? 
But last but not least, we did not want a collection of links to just, just other places. So I think across the entire site, we might have four of these. There's a couple to NARA, one to Eisenhower Li Library, that's under Sputnik, and then one to Air and Space Museum. So next was the challenge of how to make our solely electronic materials discoverable, if not available. Those are two different things. So we did that via the finding aid process. So let's pop over here. Again. So materials are broken down into 12 different record groups that my predecessor had, um, had devised, had identified. And so reorganizing them intellectually was actually a really easy process, if not physically easy, it was, it was intellectually easy. So let's, let's go here to RG2, the aerospace. Let's look at Walsh's speeches. So here we have the finding aid, right? In years past, Windows would not let you export file lists. You had to do this weird copy, paste, reformat, deformat, recopy, repaste, reformat thing. And so now we don't have to do that. Um, it just makes for a really tidy export that makes, well, it makes it easy to chop up. So even though, so I should, I, let, me re, let me backtrack. These are actually not hyperlinked um, when, we were, when we were making the Adobe portion. Adobe kept forcing this blue, so it looks like there's, they're, they're, they're hyperlinked, they're not. I tried changing the settings, it just, it just wouldn't. So is, my point is, is this entirely foolproof? Absolutely not, but it is much better than not having anything. Up until this point, or at least for NASA headquarters in DC, none of their electronic material sitting on the share drives was available. And so this is how we made it, made it available. Um, the other, talk about the DMS exports. Let me go back. So NASA HQ has this ancient database. It's probably 22 years old, which is older than my youngest child. Um, and is, it's still publicly available, but it is very difficult to navigate. It breaks constantly because it's doing things it was never intended to do. Frankly, I'm still surprised we can get into it. But fortunately, it's a relational database. And so I asked the powers that be in the, in the underground server world to run me a CSV scrape. And then I retooled all of the data headers. In the interest of time, um, I won't download it. It also tends to mess with my VPN, which then boots me off the call and then it gets all awkward, right? So, but if you're interested in thinking about how to repurpose ancient databases and how to think about it differently, this is actually a really interesting way that we did it. Um, so there is one other spot that I wanted to show you. Um, yeah, publications and newsletters. Oops. So NASA history has 287, 286, 287 books on various aspects of NASA history. And one of the difficult things that we ran into, you see these SP numbers right here? Those are kind of a business evolution of the GPO, the government printing office. And so they've, they've changed over the years. Let me find a non-SP. Yeah, so the non-SPs, um, categorizing the books actually became very, very difficult. So what Garrett and I wound up doing was making a database of, that fits up underneath this. Let me find, we'll go for societal, just because that's, yep. And so basically we made it filter for us, which, it, is it perfect? No, it's not by any stretch of the imagination. It is really dependent on the keywords. There's a, a spreadsheet up behind this that, that talks, um, that not talks, I'm sorry, that helps us do, to do this. So if you put in a keyword that isn't there, then it just not, it's just not gonna find it. But we were pretty exhaustive in our keywords and on the, the front of the GPO pages, there's the, we took their topic headings and we made them into keywords. So it, it's not a perfect site. It's not, there, there was much more that with the right resources, the amount of time that we could have done with this. But going from this, and this, 
to this was a significant improvement for everybody. Um, so are there any questions? I'm gonna come off of sharing real quick. And get back to that. It's truly amazing, Robin. Thank you. <laughs> I work in a similar field currently, and I can really relate. I'm so curious. You spoke, um, I appreciated the insights you shared about your user testing process, and I was curious how you ended up with um, listing some of those other topics under research questions rather than any other kind of heading. I'm just really, um, that's that was interesting to me. Oh, sure. So the NASA History Office has a couple of different databases that they've used over the years to track uh, rest reference questions. And so we, we took those, we chopped and sorted the data. We also took our, our Google Analytics and looked at which pages had the most hits. As you saw, it was a really exhaustive list of topics in there. And so the way that the Google Analytics works on the backside of that site allowed us to isolate the URLs and figure out what people were really reading. And then we sent out a, a couple of internal surveys across um, the, the NASA centers and said, hey, what are people asking you about? And we took all of that data and that was the 12, that whether you were at Ames or Stennis down in Mississippi or Langley or headquarters, these were the commonalities. And so we took those 12 commonalities. Cool, and if I can ask a follow-up, do you get, have any data um, or survey mechanism on the site now to find out if people are able to find what they're looking for? Yes and no. Uh, one of the, th the great things about NASA researchers, whether it is a member of the general public, or Natasha, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. I'm so glad that you were able to come today. Um, oh, so um, yes, the, the answer is, is yes. What are people looking for? The great thing about NASA researchers is they are really communicative. They have no problem telling you what they like, what they don't like, how hard it was, how easy it was, they have no problem calling you at three o'clock in the morning. And even when they don't live in Italy, US people would still call me at three o'clock in the morning. Bold. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It's cool. It, it's cool because it, one of the great things about having such a public facing job like that is that you really do get to know from a management perspective where to put your resources. Mm -hmm. um, no matter what sector, whether you're, you're federal government, state, local, independent, private, heritage house, we are all working with limited resources, right? And, and archival resources are even more limited from there. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to, to tell an engineer, no, I'm sorry, you can't have a wind tunnel because I need a database as an archivist, right? Like those are, <laughs> resources are just finite. And so having a great, really engaged user population allows you to say, I have to have it and here's the data. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Absolutely. So Rebecca says public tips on how to refine the research question proactive. Yeah, you know, it's archival research is hard. Um, I'm going to digress for, for just a second because I want to show you something that if I make no other contribution to the entire archival world, this is the one thing that I'm proud of. Can somebody... That's a good point, Lauren. Uh, I also came off <laughs> my mute uh, to talk and I saw that Jade had a comment that we skipped there. Uh, Jade, you're in a class on UX UI design. And let's see, are yeah. you still with us? Yes. And uh, yeah, how are yeah. you finding that class and uh, how does that relate to what you've seen here? Well, everything. I mean, we just did, again, I'm t I forget what Info 2.0 class it is, but we just did a whole project about creating our first databases. And obviously, this is a much more complicated iteration of that, but the skills and principles you see from user testing, research, you know, taking in demographics that you wouldn't even have thought of. I love the example with um, her kids testing it out and digital natives versus you know, Italian researchers and they're gonna have different perspectives. So I just, this whole talk was just fascinating. Excellent, and that's a good point. Uh, uh, the uh, younger people have a different way of locating information uh, than somebody who's been trained in research would have. I see Robin's back with us, so I'll be quiet now. Oh, oh thank you. So this is, this is a PowerPoint I made for a different, um, an entirely different conversation that I was having. Uh, it's a work thing. 
But when, when you're talking to your researchers, from their perspective, they come in, they come in and in their head, researcher go, research goes this way, right? You have a topic, you do some Google, you go to the library, you start bringing all of your sources together, you get a full picture of what it is that you are working on as opposed to what kind of product you want, what you want to say and how to put it out there, right? The, the point is, is that it's this way. Archives, especially government, whether you're federal down to tribal, work this way. So you have your repository, your, your, your top repository. So in this case, it would be NASA, your record group or your subject. So aeronautics, your collection will stay with Ed Walsh, your series, those were his speeches that I showed you. Uh, he doesn't actually have that much more. The, the folder, he does have textual materials. So uh, his, his notes from September, 1967, and then the cocktail napkin that he scribbled a sketch design on, right? You see, but you see how it's this way, right? It's exactly opposite. And so what we were trying to build with that thing is this big white space in here. So those 12 topics, we were trying to move people from this over to here to be able to help them best. And it was a, a really, once it was a really long time before I figured out that the reason that archival research is hard for people is because it's opposite. And so once you kind of reframe that in your head and you're like, oh yeah, that is opposite. It helps you to realize why the jump is hard. Um, it, it was also in this presentation that I basically just proved that information science is just witchcraft. Because you have archival science and information governance and records management. Anyway, th this part is immature. Hi, Robin. This is uh, Trini. This is Trini. I, I just got a quick question. How did you convince them to see it that way? That's the, that's the question I got. I mean, I understand you said the opposite, but how did you get them to see it the way you, you kind of wanted them to see it? When I was doing this particular presentation, um, every, I knew for a fact that every person in that particular meeting had at least a bachelor's degree and most people were PhDs. So I made them think about a paper that they had written in school and I made them write the, the topic or the name of the paper on a piece of paper and hold it up in front of me. So I really made them physically engage with a memory that they had. Because once you engage with that memory, you start thinking about all of the things that you had to do to accomplish it, right? And mm -hmm. so then I started talking about the topic. I, I picked, um, there was a, a man sitting in front of me and I picked his topic. And I said, okay, so when you were thinking about your topic, walk me through. So this slide is up behind me. And I said, walk me through how you did it. And he basically walked through exactly this kind of process. And so on the table in front of me, I had brought down um, a couple of boxes of, of textual records. And then there were also some, uh, there was a couple of maps in there too, because I was talking to some engineers and um, being able to find a commonality, something that they already know about helps to engage that expansion of learning. When, when they don't have to learn the whole thing that's new, when you, that, that's why we did the, the Armstrong, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that, that, right, I, I engaged with something that I knew you already knew. So anyway, um, I, I put these boxes in front of them and I showed them and I physically put them in their hands. And once they realized what they already knew here and, and why it was hard over here, because this is our business model industry-wide, then they understood. The key is to start with what they already know, something that they've done intrinsically and have embraced. In this case, it was academia, right? It was research. Right. Over to my side. But rather than trying to force it from the top down, I came from the bottom up, which is, which is very indicative of my management style as well and how I build things. Um, forcing things, especially in information management with skip, slim resources, creating right. buy-in is the most important skill that I possibly have. And um, I think that's industry-wide as well. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing is truly putting things in people's hands giving them something to touch, giving them something to make this bridge. I wouldn't have been able to do it if I hadn't put this in their hands. Mm, okay. Fascinating. That's great. Thank you. All right. Are there other questions, other thoughts? So, oh, chat right there. Um, oh, thank you, Jade. Um, and Jessica, thank you. It is, it is, easier to demonstrate 
with a, a visual than it is to try to explain that. And, and like I said, giving them something tangentially, uh, giving them something tangible, rather something that to, to make the bridge. People, um, so somebody who's very close to me is, is a college professor and he, he, he and I get into it about um, learning styles and he's, he's in the school that, you know, those, those are a, a myth that they don't really exist. I'm in the school of, if, I, if, you, if you can touch it, you can learn it. Right, like you, you have to engage all of these things for a holistic experience. Um, it can get really loud at our house, but that's. I find that if you can take something people already know and give them something to touch, and then drive a conversation, you can teach them. So, anybody else have any thoughts, anything that they want to share? And, and Dr. Franks, from a, a, an, a professor standpoint, I would love to know your thoughts on that. <laughs> we were uh, discussing uh, learning styles yesterday. Uh, I asked someone in a meeting uh, to quit talking and show me a chart. <laughs> <laughs> I'm visual, I said. It was a friend, so it was easy to do, right? Right. But I said, I know, I know you have that in a chart somewhere. Couldn't you just bring that out and let's take a look at it? Because I don't learn by hearing. I, I have to see. So I appreciate mm -hmm. your charts, your graphics. Those, to me, I'll remember. And I will also even even remember looking at a page with text on it. I'll remember text that way, but I will not remember what you're saying unless I'm also focusing with my eyes. So I, I'm with you. There are different learning styles. <laughs> Agreed. Um, so I also teach, or I, when I was at NARA, I also taught records management. And uh, so I was teaching with my buddy Jeff out of Seattle. And, and Jeff's been doing this a long time. So that it was the first time that we, we went to go teach together in uh, Flagstaff, Arizona. And I made him run me by the dollar store. And I went and I picked up these little baskets and I just filled them with little plastic Rubik's cubes and just things, right? And he's like, you know, Robin, what are you doing? I'm like, that people need this stuff. People have to, people who are kinesthetic learners, even if the object in their hand doesn't relate to what they're learning, they're gonna learn better if there's something in their hands because they're creating relational memories. And, and he lovingly patted me on my head because we're friends and he could do that. And, but, but I showed him, you know, these are how these things work and, and audiences that he had not been able to previously engage with, he started to be able to engage with. And so it's not a practice that he adopts for himself because it's not native to his teaching style. Um, he at least doesn't pat me on my head anymore. I have a friend who had done that, uh, teaches marketing, it's, um, psychology of marketing and marketing. And uh, she would teach large classrooms uh, in a lecture hall. So she would also have a basket full of things. It could be candy, it could be squeeze balls. Where, and mm -hmm. as she's talking, she'll be throwing them around the room. <laughs> you better be awake to catch them. <laughs> but it, it did keep the students engaged, as you say. Exactly. So Allison asks, let me scroll up just a touch. Um, Rebecca, you're absolutely right um, that, you know, keywords are wonderful, but it's not going to solve the whole problem. Um, there's, we have to be able to provide guidance. And that's part of honing those reference skills, right? That, that's part of not just knowing your collection, but being able to have a conversation with your researcher and bridge them over, right? I know you're here looking for a propulsion, but hey, let, let's go talk, let's go look in, in the aerospace collection because I think there's something you're going to find, right? It, it's just... People tend to have this view of, of archives and libraries and historians as like these sort of underground cave dwellers, right? That we don't like people, we don't like the light, we don't want people to touch our stuff. That there's a skill there of being able to take what your researcher wants, what they think they want and what they need and what you have and make those jumps. Um, but, and you're right, the patron has to invest the time to conducting research. That was a really difficult thing for my archivist at NASA to, to learn was where the line between being an archivist and being a research assistant came to a full stop. And so Allison asks, um, oh, I'm so glad that it's interesting for you. Um, tips and strategies to, re to give researchers to bridge that mental gap between doing archival research and other kinds of research. You know, to be Really honest, one of my friends as a graphic designer is Garrett, actually the guy, um, after we were all done with the website, I made him, well, I didn't make him, I asked him to pretty this thing up, this exact thing, and this exact thing we had hanging on the wall in the archives. 
And whenever somebody came in, when I did their, their initial research orientation, I built this into the research orientation. So here's the bathroom, here's the emergency exit, here's the vending machines. This is what you're doing here in this triangle and this is how we work and let's talk about how to get between the two. So, you know, triangles may not work for, for everybody. Some people don't like triangles. I actually had a researcher tell me that my triangles offended him. Not the content, the triangles themselves. Um, so, you know, whatever kind of thing works for your physical working space, I don't, I don't see any reason why somebody couldn't take this concept and make something like this and, and help people visualize it differently. So I'm just, I'm scrolling up and down. Um, what, would, what would be some of, so this is just because this is the way I do it doesn't mean it's the only way to do it. So what is something that somebody else might like to, to throw out there as, as a concept or a way to do this? I guess I would throw out an idea, Robin, which is, um, and I'm looking at this from not a research audience perspective, but maybe like a lay guest, lay person guest audience. Um, but it might be like, if I was going to, a, to the NASA site, not knowing anything about what I was looking for, I might be really interested in like a guided tour of some highlights um, that from, the, from which point I could see what sparks my interest and then dive in. So a little bit of like one of the learning styles that you talked about. Um, so that was something that came to mind. All right, so how about somebody that we have, we still have uh, six minutes left. So the question from Rebecca, I believe, oh, from Allison again, was what strat tips or strategies do you have to give researchers to bridge the mental gap between doing archival research and doing other kinds of academics? So I, I've shown you my triangles that just happen to work for me, but what, what about others? You're, you know, you're, you're coming up through, through school. These are things that are going to affect you. What do you see as strategies to do that? I'd like to hear from a couple of other people. I wonder if anybody in here has taken a research methods class and gotten any ideas from that because they're attempting to do uh, academic research. Uh, and uh, one of ours in Mara is geared toward writing for uh, um, journals, for example. So I don't know, has anyone gotten uh, any ideas or, or any impressions uh, that change the way you go about doing research for your 285 course? Uh, that uh, has changed uh, based on being in that class? Okay, Rebecca's so got, yeah, Rebecca's got some comments there. It may not be on my question, but I think it relates to yours. Okay, Rebecca says UX studies are something that I've recently discovered and found them to be incredibly helpful. They really are. I've been getting the help of our web staff to gather statistics about how patrons interact with the web page, and then I'll make improvements to existing web pages to help patrons answer their own frequently asked questions, which, which we do have on the site as a, as a frequently asked question um, page, link them to digital images of records, heat map studies yet yeah, improved users uh, do not spend time reading lengthy web pages. Yes, agreed. And that was part of why we chose that, that box methodology, visually speaking, um, is because we had come from a site that was nothing but scroll, 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 scroll. And you kind of didn't know when the scroll ended, right? That used to be my site and I still don't know where the scroll ended. So using the box methodology and stacking things visually the way that we did was an intentional choice on our part just for that exact reason. Users don't spend a long time reading lengthy web pages. Um, and also from a mobile perspective, it makes it easy to know when to stop. It, it frames itself nicely on, we run it, I think, against six sizes of screens and they, they stack nicely in the screen. All right, so we have about four minutes left. Is there anything, any, any thoughts, any lasting questions, impressions? I'm wondering, this is Pat again, I'm wondering if any of the students in the class uh, that uh, I'm teaching right now where they're working on collections for Preservica that will be presented through WordPress, if any of you had any 
ideas that came from viewing Robin's work that you might apply to your collections, to your own projects? I noticed one there, uh, a group of students are going to work on national parks across the United States. And on one of the pages you had uh, materials uh, grouped according to, I think, type of material like uh, documents as opposed to something else. Uh, and I was envisioning them perhaps putting together rather than saying, I'm going to do the uh, um, um, park service in California as opposed to uh, New York, whatever it may be. I wonder if they were perhaps going to now consider looking at pictures uh, as opposed to maps, as opposed to when the parks were created or whatever. We have a discussion uh, topic that will be held in class that will uh, go back to your presentation, Robin. So we'll be continuing this type of uh, discussion there. Hi, Pat. This is um, Trina. Yes, we. Uh, uh, I'm one of the members of that group. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we are looking at uh, the pictures, uh, you know, but we were thinking about the category of all of them, uh, you know, including the objects like maps and uh -huh. and of, of that nature to make sure that we. Uh, I like the way uh, Robin had them in various groups, so we can kind of group them. I that's what I was with. There it is. The images, as opposed to the oral history, as right, opposed correct. to whatever. Yeah, uh, your uh, topic came out at me because I had just been looking at the ideas earlier today, and uh, uh, it's good to be able to do them as separate, uh, um, uh, separate uh, sections from separate states. But I, I kind of like this idea too, just uh, as a consideration. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I think because your group is going to do different types of resources, some are only going to have sound, some will only have images, but yours seem to have a nice variety. Oh, thank you so much, everybody. I just, I'm noticing the time and I want to make sure that I'm respectful of that. I am happy to, to hang out and continue the discussion if anybody wants to. Um, if not, if everybody has things to get to, thank you so much for your time and attention today, your, your great interaction. I'm, I'm so pleased to be able to do this and yeah, have a great day, everybody. It's beautiful outside. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin. And have a wonderful day, everyone. <laughs>